clearly Elder Cook quoting of this indicates his own belief that it really will happen. The original Heber C. Kimball talk outlines a chronological series of events in this order. Number one, an army of elders will be sent to the four quarters of the earth in our missionary efforts. It's being done. Number two, Gentiles will gather by the thousands to this place, Salt Lake City, and it will be classed among the wickedest cities of the world. Done. All right, welcome back to the program, folks. Back to the last dispensation. You're living in it. And I am your host, Troy. Yes, it's been five years. I started this channel uh, January of 2019. And for a couple of years, I went the rounds discussing things like, I don't know, just gospel, what every uh, YouTuber and podcaster that LDS YouTuber and podcaster does when they first come on the program, they want to talk about the gathering of Israel, uh, the book of Revelation, the book of Daniel. They want to talk about the 144,000. They want to talk about uh, the new Jerusalem. They want to talk about the third temple. They want to talk about the two olive branches. You get what I'm saying? Uh, and a lot of us old timers, we did that. When I say old timers, five, six years, three years, we've been here. Now we're seeing YouTubers jump on the bandwagon and it's great. They're bearing their testimony um, and it's good stuff. But that's why you don't hear it as much anymore from us because we've covered it multiple times. I probably have covered uh, a global flood two or three times. I've covered the, the, uh, the two witnesses, the two prophets several times, uh, the third temple. Uh, the siege on Jerusalem, the book of Revelation. What, what, what are some, the 144,000, what are some others? Uh, the book of Daniel, the, uh, the, the prophecy of, of the statue, you know, that, that Daniel saw in his, and it goes on and on. So today I want to cover some things too that I've talked about before. We're going to dive in and I'm, I'm not, I, I have nothing scripted, but I pulled up we're going to dive in and talk about Heber C. Kimball's prophecies, prophecies about Salt Lake City being destroyed, prophecies about uh, the Constitution being saved by a thread. Who said that? Was it Brigham Young? Was it Joseph Smith? Was it Moore? And, and some other things. The, the Heber C. Kimball prophecy, it's interesting. I want to read you this by... Uh, a guy named Morgan, he's a blogger after the manner of Hemish. He talks, it's, it's very interesting. And he talks about the, uh, well, let me, let me read it to you and then we'll, we'll discuss it. And if you don't know the Heber C. Kimball prophecy, then you don't understand that. And it wasn't just Heber C. Kimball, but that the, that Salt Lake City would be a wicked place. Some say it's going to be destroyed. Some, you know, there's the, the, the yellow dog wagging its tail prophecy. I've, I've mentioned that a few times too. So the Heber C. Kimball prophecy, uh, this was written in 2016 uh, by a guy named Morgan. That's all I see. I was intrigued by this article. I saw online, online today. Okay, let me start over. Morgan, I was intrigued by this article I saw on online today in which states that Salt Lake was ranked among the most sinful cities in America. Now, before I go on, I want to mention this. When you think about the sin that Salt Lake City has, yes, there's lots of non-members that don't have the commandments that we keep in the church because we've made covenants, right? But the wickedness that Salt Lake City will have and that the, because the majority of, and not just Salt Lake, I would say Utah, 
And I'm not picking on Salt Lake in Utah. For those who want to get on here and say I'm picking on you. I'm going by a prophecy. But the I would say the saints. And most of the saints. When I say the wickedness of the saints. Most of the, the wickedness of the saints. Because it's concentrated in, in places like Utah. All right. So let's take Salt Lake City. It will be wicked. I would say 60% of Salt Lake is Latter-day Saint today. I c it could be lower. It was that back in 1992 when I was there. So it's been that way for a long time where it's been half and half. I think it's even 35, 40% now are Latter-day Saint in Salt Lake. But I could be wrong. But I believe it's ranked amongst, it's wicked in a different way. It's not because of the word of wisdom. It's, you know, it's not because of drugs, alcohol. Yes, drugs and alcohol are there. But the members of the church like to wiggle around certain things. I'm talking about the wicked members of the church. Yes, there are wicked members of the church. And I'm talking about the terrors uh, in, in the church. They like to wiggle around things. And um, their sins, the sins of the saints, will not be the same as the sins of the world. And I will explain. Let me go on. I thought of this prophecy. This is Morgan. I knew I had heard given by one of the early leaders of the church about how Salt Lake City would one day be one of the most wicked cities in the world. I searched, and this is the quote I found from Heber C. Kimball. Quote, after a while, the Gentiles will gather by the thousands to this place, and Salt Lake City will be classed among the wicked cities of the world. This is from a, ta a talk in 1868 by Heber C. Kimball, apparently published by the Deseret News in 1931. And today's online articles article sounds like a pretty solid fulfillment of this prophecy. As I looked at it, I realized that different parts of the talk have been quoted extensively over the years as a warning to the saints. Not only will Salt Lake become, or has become, I should say, one of the most wicked cities of the world, but the warning to the saints is that they will be seriously tried in their faith. And I thought about that, and he might mention it. Brigham Young's biggest fears one of his biggest fears for the saints was not that they could endure tribulation not that they could endure trials not that they could endure hardships like like what they endured coming west and even before that when they were persecuted before they came west he did not fear that they could overcome that and and ride that through. His biggest fear was prosperity. His biggest fear was that the Latter-day Saints were going to make money, that they were going to be successful, not just in education, but in the things of this world. They would be blessed. And there's a fine line and you can read this by a guy named uh, Fulbage, where he says there's a fine line between blessings and cursings. And I'm going to go on and read, but what does that mean? That means that when you are blessed, and we read this pride cycle, which is a, a very eternal principle, it's a factual principle. The, the pride cycle is no more or less saying, that when you are continued, when you can, when you continue to be blessed, you will experience eventual, uh, no more reliance upon the, on God. Your, your reliance upon God will be lessened. You will think that it's all coming from you. <clears throat> and eventually that can turn into your cursing or your demise. So a blessing to go topsy turvy on you. Okay. He says, I searched for the, uh, the quote, and he says, Heber C. Kimball said, quote, after a while, the Gentiles will gather by the thousands to this place. 
and they have. And Salt Lake City will be classed among the wicked cities of the world, close quote. And I feel like I could say this. I serve my mission in Salt Lake. This is from a talk in 1868 by Heber C. Kimball, apparently published by the Deseret News, May 23rd, 1931. And today's online article sounds like a pretty solid fulfillment of this prophecy. As I looked at it, I realized that different parts of the talk have been quoted extensively over the years as a warning to the saints. Not only will Salt Lake become, or has become, I should say, one of the most wicked cities of the world, but the warning, listen to this, the warning to the saints is that they will be seriously tried in their faith. So what what does that mean? You can experience trials, but they will be tried in their faith. Okay, think about that. You have people that leave the church. You have people that stay in the church. Either way, they're tried in their faith. Let me go on. A year ago, I wrote about the portion of this Heber C. Kimball talk that discusses the great test that will come upon the saints. Since then, Elder Cook also mentioned it in conference. Quote, Heber C. Kimball was one of the the original 12 apostles of this dispensation and first counselor to President Brigham Young, he warned, quote, this is Heber C. Kimball. I'm sorry, this is Brigham Young. The time is coming when it will be difficult to tell the face of a saint from the face of an enemy to the people of God. Then look out for the great sieve. For there will be a great sifting time and many will fall. Close quote. That is Brigham Young, brothers and sisters. Is, are we there now? Now, I'm not, I'm not a scaremonger. I'm not uh, an end time monger. I talk about the end times occasionally. I used to talk about it more. Like I was saying at the beginning of this, this uh, podcast. But I felt to bring it up again, because think about it. I'm not scaremongering, but are we there now? Do you see people and you won't be able to tell the difference between a saint and a man of the world? I see that today. Even in the 80s, when I was a teenager, I could tell the difference. In the 90s, I could tell. In the early 2000s, I could tell the difference. Between a saint. It was getting a little harder in the early 2000s. But you know what I mean. I see the LDS YouTubers. Pod, not people that share the gospel. There's a lot more people. Do you know how many Latter-day Saints. Work for the Gadiant and robbers. Do you know how many Latter-day Saints. Work in Silicon Valley. Do you know how many Latter-day Saints. Work in, uh, that, in politics. In government. Governor Cox is a member of the church. Do you know how many saints I talk to on a daily basis who do not care for him and care for others that serve like Mitt Romney and others? And I'm, if, if those are your guys, so be it. I don't know much about them. I do know what I hear. And I do know that the sins of the saints will be different and they will be greater because It won't be so much immorality, which it is, but it will be greed. It won't be the word of wisdom and because they will wiggle around it. Like I said, they will find ways to make themselves feel, I am worthy of this temple recommend. I can go to the temple today. I can answer the temple recommend questions. But can you? Do you feel good when you answer them? Do you really sustain? Do you truly have? Are you honest in your dealings with your fellow man? Let's go on. And I'm not saying that it's not immorality or anything like that, but it could be. But Brigham Young warned that the time will come where you won't be able to distinguish between a saint and a regular guy. Then look out. 
Brigham Young goes on to say, then look out for the great sieve, for there will be a great sifting time. Many will fall. He concluded that there is a test coming. Elder Cook quoted of this indicates his own belief that it will, that it, that, uh, that it will, that it, that, uh. clearly Elder Cook quoting of this indicates his own belief that it really will happen. The original Heber C. Kimball talk outlines a chronological series of events in this order. Number one, an army of elders will be sent to the four quarters of the earth in our missionary efforts. It's being done. Number two, Gentiles will gather by the thousands to this place, Salt Lake City, and it will be classed among the wickedest cities of the world. Done. Number three, a spirit of speculation and extravagance will take possession of the saints. Now, I was mentioning earlier, and, and well, I'll get to number four in a second, but I was mentioning earlier when you watch YouTube, when you, when you look at, uh, I'm talking about vloggers and some of these people that do these uh, reality uh, YouTube programs where, you know, even the lady that I still feel like she's being persecuted. I know she did bad things to her kids, but a lot of people do bad things to their kids and they get probation. She deserves, she needs counseling and probation. And I know she's being, her and the other later being persecuted more. And they are. Okay, how many neurotic mothers did we have back in the 80s and 90s that wouldn't have gone to jail for telling their kid to jump in a cactus? We would just say, that's bad. And they would get counseling. They would go to, anyway, I'm not going to get on that trip. But I'm talking about, I'm not a proponent of child. Uh, sorry, I'm not a proponent of that. But I'm talking about when you see people on YouTube, when you see them on the streets, when you see them um, in Hollywood, and there's a lot of less active Latter-day Saints in Hollywood too. They're all over. Members of the church, the saints are in all industries of life, in all aspects of life. And when you look at them, when you look at them, they have the same spirit of speculation and extravagance that uh, non-members have, the Gentiles. We'll just say the Gentiles, because that's what we call them. Gentiles, people that aren't members of the church. The word Gentile has many connotations and meanings. And number four, persecution comes next. And all true Latter-day Saints will be tested to the limit. Many will apostatize. And that persecution is not always going to be your little favorite persecution. Like Brigham Young said, I don't fear that they can endure trials and hardships and real persecution. I, I, endure, I, I fear their prosperity. Well, remember the jab that didn't come on our little cup of what we were ready for. Right. Uh, home centered, uh, gospel centered home. Uh, third hour, two hour church. That didn't, there was a lot of people that had problems with that. And they were the people that wanted the church, not saying everybody, okay? I'm generalizing because I, I don't have time, right? But they were people that uh, wanted the church to raise their kids in that great organization. I have relatives with big families that were bringing their kids to church, but they were busy making money. But we go to church and we go to the temple every six months, every three months, they stopped coming. When, when we did come follow me, they said, I, and, and, and a lot of them went, ended up going to some of these uh, mega churches or some of our contemporary new age church, <clears throat> not new age, but new Christian uh, rock and roll coffee in the, in the foyer. We have a, a, and they're good people, but we have a church here, not to digress too much off the topic, or it's, it's a mega church and they have a band and they have a coffee bar in the, in the foyer. And uh, we had a lot of people from the ward start going there. It's strange. And it was during, if we're going to not have the church raise our kids and things are just going kooky, uh, 
let's just go to an hour over here. And plus we have problems with the history of the church and things like that. So my point is, is that it doesn't always come in the cup of our pers favorite persecution that we are ready to endure. It's not just blatant. It's not just spell like, um, like Brigham Young said. So the persecution comes next and all true Latter-day Saints will be tested to the limit. Many will apostatize done. We're there. Morgan goes on to say, it seems safe to say that the first three have already taken place, or at least that they are taking place now. The four seems to yet await us, though it becomes increasingly easier to envision how that might happen as the political thinking of the world diverges more and more from the church. Elder, Elder Hales also warned us of the fulfillment of this. <clears throat> In recent decades, the church has largely been spared the terrible misunderstandings and persecutions experienced by the early saints. It will not always be so. Will not always be so. The world is moving away from the Lord faster and farther than ever before. Look at where all the true crime is coming out of. I'm a true crime guy. I watched those things. As a matter of fact, I'm starting a true crime podcast for some of you that might be interested in that. Yes, I am going to be slow. I served a five-year mission on YouTube. <laughs> Give me a break, guys. I can do something different. Um, but true crime podcast, if you look at true crime, it's coming out of Utah and Idaho a lot, isn't it? When that happens everywhere. But why are they honing in on those areas? You could say, well, look at all the crazy things happening. It's because there's crazy Mormons and, and people are crazy and white people, white Christian Mormon nationalists, fake Mormons killing their kids, right? Well, that happens everywhere. And you don't have to be a Christian. You don't have to be a nationalist. And you don't have to be Latter-day Saint. It, it, it happens everywhere. People are killing their kids. People are doing weird, crazy things in all the states. But you do see a lot of it honing in on. Look at Tim Ballard. I mean, come on. I, that still doesn't set right with me. So, uh, the world is moving away from the Lord faster and farther than ever before. That still Elder Hales. God bless him and God rest his soul. Our safety, it seems, lies in the scriptures, and we tell our seminary students that, and in holding fast to the words of God, despite the influences that are around us. I think Mormon's description of the power of the word of God sums it up. He says, this is Morgan, uh, quote, whosoever will lay hold upon the word of God, which is quick and powerful, which shall divide asunder all the cunning and snares and the wiles of the devil. And lead the man of Christ in a straight and narrow course across that everlasting gulf of misery, which is spared to engulf the wicked and land their souls, yea, their immortal souls, at the right hand of God in the kingdom of heaven. Helaman 3, 29, 30 through 30. Following the word of God is indeed a narrow course. Especially when you were prospering especially when your cup of your favorite persecution or when you're sideswiped with a persecution that you thought wasn't coming. Oh, whoa. You mean I have to accept that the brethren did this and that's not how I was raised in the church? I'm talking from personal experience. I've had to get on my knees about certain things and the Lord has told me, and maybe it'll help some of you, the Lord has told me that you don't understand all things, Troy. Nephi said, I don't know the meaning of all things, but I know, the, I know that the Lord loveth his children. Well, I would like to add, I don't know the meaning of all things, but I know that the church is true. I know that the 15 men are guiding and leading this the best they can. They have a mantle upon them. It's not coming from them. They, are, they have a muzzle on them, a spiritual like yoke 
they have to do, they do things probably so many times. We know we've been in callings where we're like, why did I say that? I came to do this and all of a sudden I decided to do this and the spirit moved me. The spirit is moving upon 15 men. I don't care. The Lord could put Pinocchio up there. And he's got no strings, right? Pinocchio could go up there and, um, and God would move him to do mysterious things. I think I said that because I saw Elder Holland with a Pinocchio nose. That, that's horrible. That is horrible. Anyway, uh, following the word of God is indeed a narrow course that can seem very difficult at times, but it is the only way to protect ourselves from the snares and the wiles of the devil being sideswiped with your non-favorite persecution or the one you thought isn't a, a persecution you don't recognize that it's working on you. And it could be, are you going to accept that the brethren are doing the right thing? Our devotion to God's words will be our protection as we prepare for the uncertain times ahead. As the Savior put it, quote, and whoso tre treasureth up my word shall not be deceived. The son of man shall come, close quote. Joseph Smith, Matthew 137. I'm tripping all over my words, but you get it. So in essence, we are seeing that take place. Will there be judgments upon the saints, upon Zion? When I went to Salt Lake City on my mission in 1992, this hits home. I, w I was raised in the church in California. I had never been to Utah because I was raised in a part member family that didn't have a lot of money. I was so excited to go to Zion. It was a trial of my faith because the first area I served in was the Pioneer Stake, which was 700 South, 900 West. There were Polynesian gangs, old people, old buildings, and a lack of enthusiasm enthusiasm for missionary work it was not zion but then i got to know the people and i realized they have different trials they have different things going on it's not the same missionary field of course not you're, when your members are when your neighbors are members but we did a lot of activating bringing people into the folds of the church who were already baptized and baptizing their children. It was a miraculous thing. And I love the Salt Lake people. So please don't think that I'm putting you down. I love you. With all my heart. I miss you guys. I love talking about my mission. Heavenly Father sent me there. Because he knew that I wanted to go there. I, I loved. I was so excited to go to Salt Lake. So be good. Be good in Salt Lake, okay? Anyway, you guys take care.